I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I, Franklin Coolidge. I, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. It's this moment. And will, to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. It's these words. Preserve, protect, and defend. Once spoken. The Constitution of the United, United States. States. That have the power to transform any citizen into a president. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. So don't mess it up. That I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the president office of president of the, the United States. The office of president of the United States faithfully. The office of the presidency of the United States. Whoopsie. Maintain and defend the office of president of the United States. Uh oh. I'm ready to administer the oath. To tell the story of the presidential oath of office, let's start at the beginning with this guy, the old $1 bill himself, George Washington. Or the next best thing. As our nation's first president, he was the first to recite the oath back on April 30th, 1789. George Washington. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. The oath of office is written into the United States Constitution and it's the only part meant to be administered word for word. Reserve, protect, and defend. The framers carefully added these specific 35 words as the binding pledge a new president makes to the country. And I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And Washington was the first person ever to get a crack at it. That I will to the best of my ability. He took the oath at Federal Hall in New York City. But these days, most presidents take it outside the U.S. Capitol. The Office of President of the United States. The Office of President of the United States. The Constitution doesn't say who has to administer the oath, but generally, it's the Chief Justice. The Constitution of the United States. It was Washington's idea to kiss the Bible, and almost every president after him did the same. That is until Dwight Eisenhower decided enough of that. He put the tradition to rest in 1953 and said a prayer instead. That thou wilt make full and complete. So help me God. Now that line is up for debate. The words, so help me God, are not written in the Constitution. And historians are not sure whether Washington was the first to say them. But most presidents have added them to the end of their oath. So help me God. Fast forward two centuries later, the oath remains a very sacred tradition in our country. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. This is the grand theater and the grand spectacle of watching a democracy at work where an entire government hands over a baton to the next government. It does not happen until the words of the oath are uttered. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend. And the words matter. You have to say the words correctly. And if it goes sideways, you're going to have to do a do-over like Barack Obama did. Yep, Barack Obama had a redo in 2009. The oath of office went sideways, largely for Supreme Court Justice Roberts' mistake. Are you prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. President Obama started taking the oath, but Justice Roberts' language was different than what Obama was I thinking. I swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. And they were kind of counterposing each other, and they would go kind of back and forth, execute and it was an awkward President moment. The United States faithfully. And I will execute. The off faithfully, the pres office of President of the, the United States. The office of President of the United States faithfully. Immediately, people That's called it a botched oath. Some people even questioned his President Obama, real president. The next morning, a new Justice Department official named David Barron called the White House counsel and said, you know, we might want to think about doing this again. And that's what set in motion the redo later that day. I would describe the atmosphere in the White House as kind of sheepish. Everyone was kind of embarrassed to have to do this again. Four years later, he took it two more times. But that's because in 2013, January 20th landed on a Sunday. When that happens, the president-elect takes the oath privately in the White House and then publicly the next day. Good job, Dad. I did it. Yeah, Dad, good job. Can I call you Dad? Thank you, everybody. In all, Obama has taken the oath four times. The only other president to take the oath that many times is FDR. But that's only because he was elected president four times. A little different. Of course, Obama isn't the only president whose swearing-in ceremony has been a little bit weird. For example, 
It didn't go so smoothly for President Truman in 1945. Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office as 32nd president. There's no audio of it, but when Harry S. Truman took the oath, Chief Justice Harlan Stone said, I, Harry, ship Truman. But Stone made that up. Truman's middle name is just the letter S. Faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. It also wasn't perfect for Herbert Hoover in 1929. To the best of your ability that you will preserve, maintain, and defend. It's subtle, but did you pick up on that? Chief Justice William Howard Taft said maintain instead of protect the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States. In 1909, when Taft himself was sworn in, his oath was also misquoted. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. While those earlier administrations played a little fast and loose with the oath, Obama's camp felt differently because of, well, you know, I'm not going to say it. Obama himself had nothing to do with the decision to redo the oath. It was the people around him, his aides, who knew that politically, as much as legally, it was very important to establish his legitimacy. They knew he was the first African American. They knew these false questions had been raised about his birthplace. So they decided, let's foreclose any controversy and redo the whole thing. Maybe we should just go back to the way they administered the oath in the 1800s. Originally, whoever was administering the oath would ask it as a question, do you such and such solemnly swear? And then the person would respond just by saying, I do, or I do solemnly swear. I do. In more modern times, the new president actually repeats every single word. That I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute. The, the whole idea of taking an oath to assume a new office goes back to ancient times. I, Harry S. Truman, do solemnly swear. The presidential oath is shorter than any other official oath. It's shorter than most wedding vows, shorter than the Hippocratic Oath, on my honor, I will do my best. Even the Boy Scouts have a longer oath. The Boy Scouts. It takes more words to promise to get an old lady safely across the street than it does to get the nuclear codes. Mentally awake and morally straight. But how much do Americans know about the oath of office? We decided to test a few to find out. And since we like our tests with chicken wings, we headed to the Founding Fathers Bar in Buffalo, New York. Welcome to Founding Fathers. We're going to be taking the CNN Oath of Office Trivia Challenge. Are we ready? Not really. All right. Who was the only president to take the oath of office from a female official? Uh, Bill Clinton? He was good with the ladies. LBJ. It was federal judge Sarah Hughes aboard Air Force One in Dallas, Texas. Oh my God, I totally didn't know that. Which president and what year was the first oath of office to take place in Washington, D.C. 1492, 1776, my mom's birthday. Jeffrey said right here, 1801. This guy's going too fast, right? Who was the first president to affirm rather than swear the oath of office? What's the difference? Those are synonyms. Pierce, Franklin Pierce, we have a winner. Pierce, that's a president? Here's another piece of trivia. When Donald Trump takes the oath of office this year, He'll be the first president since Eisenhower to be sworn in without any political experience. What won't be different is all the fanfare, including the president's own United States Marine Band. Hey, how can I get a Marine Band? We think we've played for every presidential inauguration since 1801, since Thomas Jefferson. Music is actually central to the inaugural ceremony. It really is the thing that glues the entire ceremony together. And when we come to the part of the presidential oath, the music really is the thing that I think seals the deal for the new president of the United States. <laughs> I feel more presidential right now. Immediately following the oath, we play Four Ruffles and Flourishes. And then we play Hail to the Chief, which is official honors for the President of the United States. These guys are good. And this is the first time the new president hears Hail to the Chief. 
When we have an inauguration where the new president is not the incumbent, we actually play hail to the chief twice. We will play hell to the chief for President Obama for the very last time in his administration. And then when President Trump is sworn in, we will play hail to the chief for the very first time for the new president. The oath and the music brings the entire ceremony to its zenith. Sure, it may seem like a lot of pomp and circumstance, but in the end, it is so much bigger than that. Because even when all the fanfare is stripped away, even in a simple home like Chester Arthur, on board a plane in a time of crisis like Lyndon Johnson, even behind closed doors at the White House to make up for a mistake. It really is all about the oath. 35 words with the power to make a president and hopefully unite the country.